हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते आदाब सत मैं प्रोफेसर दत्तात्रेय गुड़ के आप सभी का फिर से एक बार स्वागत करता हूँ आपके चहेते शो में जिसका नाम है रीड विथ मी चलिए कुछ अच्छा सुनते हैं इन अर्लियर फ्यू एपिसोड्स वी हैव स्टार्टेड रीडिंग अ वेरी स्पेशल बुक व्हिच इज एंटाइटल्ड एज थिंक एंड ग्रो रिच विच इज रिटन बाय नेपोलियन हिल सो फार वी हैव कम्प्लीटेड रीडिंग फर्स्ट फोर पार्ट ऑफ दिस वेरी स्पेशल बुक इफ यू हैव मिस्ड एनी ऑफ द पार्ट ऑफ दिस ऑडियो बुक प्लीज फाइंड द लिंक ऑफ दैट पार्ट इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन बॉक्स यू कैन क्लिक ऑन द लिंक एंड यू कैन एंजॉय द लर्निंग इन टूडेज एपिसोड वे आर गोइंग टू डील विद द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ दिस थिंक एंड ग्रो रिच बुक विच इज रिटन बाय नेपोलियन हिल इज कंसर्न so far we have completed reading many of the uh, audio books which comprises of uh, ikigai a japanese method for long and happy life then inner engineering a yogi's guide to joy then how to take back control of your life then the power of your subconscious mind then the power of positive thinking and so on if you are interested in reading or uh, instead of saying reading you are interested in listening these audio books you can find the link of those books in the description box and you can go over there and you can enjoy the listening in order to appreciate our efforts and in order to encourage our team to record more and more audio books and keep it at your service please do subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon As you are going to press the bell icon you will get a notification regarding our new audio book which is uploaded at our YouTube channel. Thank you thank you so much all of you for showering so much love to this read with me show. In a shortest possible time we have reached towards over a million people through these audio books and I am damn sure that in coming time you are also going to help me as well as to our team by uh, by sharing these audio books with as many people as you can kyunki bahut sare jo bhi millionaires billionaires successful log hai unhone bataya hai ki sabse jo important habit hoti hai okay kisi bhi aadmi ki wo sabse important ek habit zaruri hai in order to become a successful person that is you have to read something in each and every day ओके okay, मान लीजिए आप हर रोज अगर दो ही पेज अगर पढ़ते हैं मान लीजिए आप पर्सनालिटी डेवलपमेंट के रिगार्डिंग दो पेज हर रोज पढ़ते हैं तो साल में तीन सौ पैंसठ दिन होते हैं लेटस एक्सक्लूड सिक्सटी फाइव डेज लेटस कंसिडर ओनली थ्री हंड्रेड डेज देन यू आर गोइंग टू रीड थ्री हंड्रेड मल्टीप्लाइड बाई टू पेजेस एवरी डे सिक्स हंड्रेड पेजेस नॉलेज यू आर गोइंग टू पजेस एट द एंड ऑफ वन ईयर let us calculate the you are going to continue with the same practice of reading only two pages per day within coming only five years you are going to get how much knowledge in a year you are going to read almost 600 pages multiplied by five years matlab around you are going to have 3000 pages knowledge and that 3000 pages knowledge is very huge and it will take your life that may be personal life or professional life to the greater heights okay this is the significance and the power behind reading or we can say power behind starting this read with me show ab ye show humne kyun shuru kiya kyunki ab jo hamari aaj ki life hai bhagdaud bhari zindagi hai hamari sab ki तो हमें दो पेज बैठ के रीड करने में समय नहीं मिलता है लेकिन वे आर स्पेंडिंग लॉट मच टाइम ऑन सोशल मीडिया हैंडल्स सो अलॉन्ग विथ अवर टीम व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू वेर एवर यू आर गोइंग टू स्पेंड यूर टाइम देयर यू वी आर गोइंग टू पुट द कंटेंट इन सच वे दैट इंस्टेड ऑफ इन्वेस्टिंग टाइम इन अदर थिंग्स यू कैन इन्वेस्ट यूर टाइम इन रीडिंग दो टू पेजेस होप सो की यू मैट बी क्लियर विद द रीड विथ मी शो ऑलरेडी जो भी लोग हमारे साथ कनेक्टेड है दे आर नोइंग दिस बेटर दैन मी स्टिल फॉर न्यू व्यूवर्स इट इज माई ड्यूटी टू एक्सप्रेस वाई वी हैव स्टार्टेड दिस शो और वट इज द सोर्स ऑफ मोटिवेशन बिहाइंड स्टार्टिंग द शो यू मैट बी क्लियर विद दिस एंड इन ऑर्डर टू गेट नोटिफिकेशन रिगार्डिंग आवर न्यू ऑडियो बुक्स विच आर अपकमिंग वट यू हैव टू डू यू हैव टू सब्सक्राइब टू अवर चैनल सो दैट यू विल गेट notification regarding our new audio book launch okay thank you thank you so much once again and along with me our team is really really grateful for all of you for making this show so much successful 
सो लेटस गेट अ हेड विथ द पार्ट नंबर फाइव ऑफ दिस व्हेरी स्पेशल बुक एंटाइटल्ड एज थिंक एंड ग्रो रिच विच इज अ रिटर्न बाय नेपोलियन हिल लेटस गेट स्टार्टेड विथ चैप्टर नंबर थर्टीन द ब्रेन अ ब्रॉडकास्टिंग एंड रिसीविंग स्टेशन फॉर थॉट द ट्वेल्थ स्टेप टूवर्ड्स रिचेस मोर देन ट्वेंटी इयर्स एगो द ऑथर वर्किंग इन कंजंक्शन विथ द लेट डॉक्टर अलेक्जेंडर ग्रहम बेल एंड डॉक्टर एलमेर आर गेट्स ऑब्जर्व दैट एवरी ह्यूमन ब्रेन इज बोथ अ ब्रॉडकास्टिंग एंड रिसीविंग स्टेशन फॉर द वाइब्रेशन ऑफ थॉट थ्रू द मीडियम ऑफ इथर इन अ फैशन सिमिलर टू दैट एम्प्लॉयड बाय द रेडियो ब्रॉडकास्टिंग प्रिंसिपल एवरी ह्यूमन ब्रेन इज कैपेबल ऑफ पिकिंग अप वाइब्रेश ऑफ थॉट विच आर बींग रिलीज बाय अदर ब्रेन्स इन कनेक्शन विद द स्टेटमेंट इन द प्रोसीडिंग पैराग्राफ कंपेयर एंड कंसिडर द डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ द क्रिएटिव इमेजिनेशन एज आउटलाइन इन द चैप्टर ऑन इमेजिनेशन The creative imagination is the receiving state of the brain which receives thoughts released by the brain of others. It is the agency of communication between one's conscious and the reasoning mind and the four sources from which one may receive thought stimuli. When stimulated or stepped up to a high rate of vibration the mind becomes more receptive to the vibration of thought. which reaches it through the ether from outside sources this stepping up process takes place through the positive emotions or the negative emotions through the emotions the vibrations of thought may be increased vibrations of an exceedingly high rate are the only vibrations picked up and carried by the ether from one brain to another thought is energy traveling at an exceedingly high rate of vibration thought which has been modified or stepped up by any of the major emotions vibrates at a much higher rate than ordinary thought and it is this type of thought which passes from one brain to another through the broadcasting machinery of the human brain the emotion of sex stands at the head of list of the human emotions as far as intensity and driving forces are concerned the brain which has been stimulated by the emotion of sex vibrates at a much more rapid rate than it does when that emotion is quiescent or absent the result of sex transmutation is the increase of the rate of vibration of the thoughts to which a pitch that the creative imagination becomes highly receptive to ideas which it picks up from the ether on the other hand when the brain is vibrating at a rapid rate it not only attracts the thoughts and ideas released by other brains through the medium of the ether but it gives to one's own thought that feeling which is essential before those thoughts will be picked up and acted upon by one's subconscious mind thus you will see that the broadcasting principle is the factor through which you mix feeling or emotion with your thoughts and pass them on to your subconscious mind the subconscious mind is the sending station of the brain through which vibrations of thought are broadcast the creative imagination is the receiving set through which the vibrations of thought are picked up from the ether along with the important factors of the subconscious mind and the faculty of the creative imagination which constitutes the sending and receiving sets of your mental broadcasting machinery consider now the principle of auto suggestion which is the medium by which you may put into operation your broadcasting station through the instructions described in the chapter on auto suggestion you were definitely informed of the method by which a desire may be transmuted into its monetary equivalent operation of your mental broadcasting station station is a comparatively simple procedure you have but three principles to bear in mind and to apply when you wish to use your broadcasting station the subconscious mind creative imagination and auto suggestion the stimuli through which you put these three principles into action have been described the procedure begins with a desire the greatest forces are in a tangible the depression brought the world to the very very borderline of understanding of the forces which are intangible and unseen 
through the ages which have passed man has depended too much upon his physical senses and has limited his knowledge to the physical things which he could see touch weigh and measure we are now entering the most marvelous of all ages an age which will teach us something of the intangible forces of the world about us perhaps we shall learn as we pass through this age that the other self is more powerful than the physical self we see when we look into a mirror sometimes men speak lightly of the intangibles the thing which they cannot perceive through any of their five senses and when we hear them it should remind us that all of us are controlled by forces which are unseen and intangible the whole of mankind has not the power to cope with nor the control the intangible force wrapped up in the rolling waves of the oceans man has not the capacity to understand the un- intangible force of gravity which keeps this little earth suspended in mid air and keeps man from falling from it much less the power to control that force man is entirely subservient to the intangible force which comes with a thunderstorm and he just as helpless in the presence of the intangible force of electricity ne he does not he does not even know the what electricity is where it comes from or what is its purpose nor is this by any means the end of a man's ignorance in connection with things unseen and intangible he does not understand the intangible force and intelligence wrapped up in the soil of earth the force which provides him with every morsel of food he eats every article of the clothing he wears every dollar he carries in his pocket the dramatic story of the brain last but not least man with all of his boasted culture and education understands little or nothing of the intangible force the greatest of all intangibles of thought he knows but little concerning the physical brain and its vast network of intricate machinery through which the power of thought is translated into its material equivalent but he is now entered an age which shall yield enlightenment on the subject already men of science have begun to turn their attention to the study of this stupendous thing called a brain and while they are still in the kindergarten stage of their studies they have uncovered enough knowledge to know that the central switchboard of the human brain the number of lines which connects the brain cells one with another equal the figure 1 followed by 15 million ciphers The figure is so stupendous said Dr C Jordan Herrick of the University of Chicago that astronomical figures dealing with hundreds of millions of light years become insignificant by comparison it has been determined that there are from 10000 millions to 14000 million nerve cells in the human cerebral cortex and we know that these are arranged in a definite patterns these arrangements are not a haphazard they are orderly recently developed methods of electrophysiology draw up action currents from very precisely located cells or fibers with micro electrodes amplify them with radio tubes and record potential differences to millionth of a volt it is inconceivable that such a network of integrate machinery should be in existence for the sole purpose of carrying on the physical functions incidental to growth and maintenance of the physical body it is not likely that the same system which gives billions of brain cells and media for communication one with another provides also the means of communication with other intangible forces after this book had been written just before the manuscript went to the publisher there appeared in the new york times an editorial showing that at least one great university and one intelligent investigator in the field of mental phenomenon are carrying on an organized research through which conclusions have been reached that parallel many of those described in this and the following chapter 
The editorial briefly analyzed the work carried out by Dr. Rainey and his associates at Duke University, which are what is telepathy. A month ago, we cited on this page some of the remarkable results achieved by Professor Ren and his associates in Duke University from more than 100,000 tests to determine the existence of a telepathy and clearance. These results were summarized in the first two articles in Harper's magazine. In the second, which has now appeared, the author E. H. Wright attempts to summarize what, he, what has been learned or what it seems reasonable to infer regarding the exact nature of these extrasensory modes of perception. The actual existence of telepathy and clearance now seems to some scientists enormously probable as the result of Rennie's experiment. Various uh, percipients were asked to name as many cars in a special park as they could without looking at them and without other sensory access to them. About a score of men and women were discovered who would regularly name so many of the cards correctly that there was not one chance in many a million million of their having doing their feats by luck or accident. But how did they do them? These powers assuming that they exist do not seem to be sensory. There is no known organ for them. The experiments worked just as well at distances of several hundred miles as they did in the same room. These facts also dispose in Mr. Wright's opinion of the attempt to explain telepathy or clearance through any physical theory of radiation. All known forms of radiant energy decline inversely as the square of the distance travels. Telepathy and clearance do not. But they do vary through physical causes as our own as our other mental powers do. Contrary to widespread opinion, they do not improve when the percipient is asleep or half asleep but no, on the contrary when he is most wide awake and alert. Ren discovered that a narcotic will invariably lower a percipient's score while a stimulant will always send it higher. The most reliable performer apparently cannot make a good score unless he tries to do his best. One conclusion that Wright draws with some confidence is that telepathy and clearance are really one and, a, and the same gift. That is, the faculty that sees a card face down on a table seems to be exactly the same one that reads a thought residing only in another mind. There are several grounds for believing this so far. For example, the two gifts have been found in every person who enjoys either of them. In everyone so far, the two have been of equal vigor almost exactly. Screens, walls, distances have no effect at all on either. Wright advances from this conclusion to express what he puts forward as no more than the mere hunch that other extrasensory experiences, prophetic dreams, prenomations of disaster and the like may also prove to be part of the same faculty. The reader is not asked to accept any of these conclusions unless he finds it necessary but the evidence that Ryan was peeled up must remain impressive. In view of Dr. Rennie, Rennie's announcement in a connection with the conditions under which the mind responds to what he terms extra sensory modes of perception. I now feel privileged to add to his testimony by saying that my associates and I have discovered what we believe to be the ideal conditions under which the mind can be stimulated so that sixth sense described in the next chapter can be made to function in a practical way. The condition to which I refer consists of a close working alliance between myself and two members of my staff. Through experimentation and practice, we have discovered how to stimulate our minds by applying the principles used in connection with the invisible counselors described in this next chapter. So that we can by a process of blending our three minds into one, find the solution to a great variety of personal problems which are submitted by my clients. 
The procedure is very simple. We sit down at a conference table, clearly state the nature of the problem we have under consideration, then begin, begin discussing it. Each contributes whatever thoughts that may occur. The strange thing about this method of mind stimulation is that it places each participant in communication with unknown sources of knowledge definitely outside his own experience. If you understand the principle described in the chapter on the mastermind, you of course or recognize the round table procedure here described as being a practical application of the mastermind. This method of mind stimulation through harmonious discussion of definite subjects between three people illustrates the simplest and most practical use of the mastermind. By adapting and following a similar plan, any student of this philosophy may come into possession of the famous Carnegie formula briefly described in the introduction. If it means nothing to you at this time, mark this page and read it again after you have finished the last chapter. Let us get ahead with chapter number 14, The Sixth Sense, The Door to the Temple of Wisdom, the thirteenth step towards riches. The thirteenth principle is known as the sixth sense through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort without any effort from, from or demand by the individual. This principle is the apex of the philosophy. It can be assimilated, understood and applied only by first mastering the other 12 principles. The sixth sense is that portion of the subconscious mind which has been referred to as the creative imagination. It has also been referred to as the receiving set through which ideas, plans, thoughts, flash into the mind, the flashes are sometimes called hunches or inspirations. The sixth sense, sixth sense defies a description. It cannot be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy. Because such a person has no knowledge and no experience with which the sixth sense may be compared. Understanding of the sixth sense comes only by meditation through mind development from within. The sixth sense probably is the medium of contact between the finite mind of a mind and infinite intelligence and for this reason it is a mixture of both the mental and the spiritual. It is believed to be the point at which the mind of a man contacts the universal mind. After you have mastered the principles described in this book, you will be prepared to accept as a truth a statement which may otherwise be incredible to you, namely, through the aid of the sixth sense, you will be warned of impeding, impeding danger in a time to avoid them and notified to of opportunities in time to embrace them. There comes to your aid and to do your bidding with the development of the sixth sense, a guardian angel who will open to you at all times the door to the temple of wisdom. Whether or not this is a statement of truth, you will never know except by following the instructions described in the pages of this book or some similar method of procedure. The author is not a believer in nor an advocate of miracles for the reason that he has enough knowledge of nature to understand that nature never deviates from her established laws. Some of her laws are so incomprehensible, incomprehensible that they produce what appears to be miracles. The sixth sense comes as near to being a miracle as anything I have ever experienced and it appears so only because I do not understand the method by which the principle is operated. This much the author does know that there is a power or a first cause or an intelligence which permeates every atom of matter and embraces every unit of energy perceptible to man that this infinite intelligence converts acorns into oak trees, causes water to flow downhill in response to the law of gravity, follows night with day and winter with summer, each maintaining its proper place and relationship to the other. This intelligence may through the principles of this philosophy be induced to aid in a transmuting desires into concrete or material form. 
the author has this knowledge because he has experimented with it and has experienced it step by step to the through the preceding chapters you have been led to the last principle if you have mastered each of the preceding principles you are now prepared to accept without being skeptical the stupendous claims made here if you have not mastered the other principles you must do so before you may determine definitely whether or not the claims made in this chapter are facts or fiction while i was passing through the age of hero worship i found myself trying to imitate those whom i most admired moreover i discovered that the element of faith with which with which i endeavored to imitate my idols gave me great capacity to do so quite successfully i have never entirely divested myself of this habit of hero worship although i have passed the age commonly given over to such my experience has taught me that the next best thing to being a truly great is to emulate the great by feeling and action as nearly as possible long before i had ever written a line for publication and or endeavored to deliver a speech in public i followed the habit of reshaping my own character by trying to imitate the nine men who lives and life works had been most impressive to me these nine men were emerson pen edison darwin lincoln burbank napoleon ford and carnegie every night over a long period of years i held an imaginary council meeting with this group whom i called my invisible counselors The procedure was this just before going to sleep at night i would shut my eyes and see in my imagination this group of men seated with me around my council table here i had not only an opportunity to sit among those whom i considered to be great but i actually dominated the group by serving as the chairman i had a very definite purpose in indulging my imagination through these nightly meetings My purpose was to rebuild my own character so it would represent a composite of the characters of my imaginary counselors realizing as i did early in life that i had to overcome the handicap of birth in an environment of ignorance and superstition i deliberately assigned myself the task of voluntary rebirth through the method here described building character through auto suggestion Being an earnest student of psychology I knew of course that all men have become what they are because of their dominating thoughts and desires I knew that every deeply seated desire has the effect of causing one to seek outward expression through which that desire may be transmuted into reality I knew that self suggestion is a powerful factor in building character that it is in fact the sole principle through which character is built with this knowledge of principles of mind operation i was fairly well armed with the equipment needed in rebuilding my character in these imaginary council meetings i called on my cabinet members for the knowledge i wished each to contribute addressing myself to each member in audible words as follows as follows Mr Emerson I desire to acquire from you the marvelous understanding of nature which distinguished your life I ask that you make an impress upon my subconscious mind of whatever qualities you possess which enable you to understand and adapt yourself to the laws of nature I ask that you assist me in reaching and drawing upon whatever sources of knowledge are available to this end Mr Burbank I request that you pass on to me the knowledge which enabled you to so harmonize the laws of nature that you caused the cactus to shed its thorns and become an edible food give me access to the knowledge which enabled you to make two blades of grass grow where but one grew before and help and help you to blend the coloring of the flowers with more splendor and harmony for you alone how successfully gilded the lily 
Napoleon, I desire to acquire from you by emulsion the marvelous ability you possess to inspire men and to arouse them to greater and more determined spirit of action. Also to acquire the spirit of enduring faith which enabled you to turn defeat into victory and to surmount the staggering obstacles. Emperor of faith, king of chance, man of destiny, I salute you. Mr. Payne, I desire to acquire from you the freedom of thought and the courage and clarity with which to express convictions which so distinguished you. Mr. Darwin, I wish to acquire from you the marvelous patience and ability to study cause and effect without bias or prejudice so exemplified by you in the field of natural science. Mr. Lincoln, I desire to build into my own character the keen sense of justice, the untiring spirit of patience, the sense of humor and the human understanding and the tolerance which were your distinguishing characteristics. Mr. Carnegie, I am already indebted to you for my choice of a life work which has brought me great happiness and peace of mind. I wish to acquire a I wish to acquire a thorough understanding of the principles of organized effort, which you used so effectively in the building of a great industrial enterprise. Mr. Ford, you have been among the most helpful of the men who have supplied much of the material essential to my work. I wish to acquire your spirit of persistence, the determination, poise and self-confidence which have enabled you to master poverty, organize, unify and simplify human effort so I may help others to follow in your, in your footsteps. Mr. Edison, I have seated you nearest to me at my right because of the personal cooperation you have given me during my research into the causes of success and failure. I wish to acquire from you the marvelous spirit of faith with which you have uncovered so many of nature's secret, the spirit of unremitting toil with which you have so often restored victory from defeat. My method of addressing the members of the imaginary cabinet would vary according to the traits of character in which I was for the moment most interested in acquiring. I studied the records of their lives with the pain stackling care. After some months of this nightly procedure, I was astounded by the discovery that these imaginary figures became apparently real. Each of these nine men developed individual characteristics which surprised me. For example, Lincoln developed the habit of always being late then walking around in a solemn parade. When he came, he walked very slowly with his hands clasped behind him and once in a while he would stop as he passed and rest his hand momentarily upon my shoulder. He always wore an expression of seriousness upon his face. Rarely did I see him smile. The cares of a surrendered nation made him grave. That was not true of the others. Burbank and Payne often indulged in a witty repertory which seemed at a times to shock the other members of the cabinet. One night Payne suggested that I prepare a lecture on the age of reason and deliver it from the pulpit of a church which I formerly attended. Many around that table laughed heartily at the suggestion not Napoleon. He drew his mouth down at the corners and groaned so loudly that all turned and looked at him with amazement. To him the church was but a pawn of the state not to be reformed but to be used as a convenient incitor to mass activity by the people. On one occasion Burbank was late when he came he was excited with enthusiasm and explained that he had been late because of an experiment he was making through which he hoped to be able to grow apples on any sort of tree. Pen cheated, cheated him by reminding him that it was an apple which started all the trouble between man and woman. Darwin chuckled heartily as he suggested that Pen should watch out for little serpents when he went into the forest to gather apples as they had the habit of growing into big snakes 
Emerson observed no serpents, no apples, and Napoleon remarked no apples, no state. Lincoln developed the habit of always being the last one to leave the table after each meeting. On one occasion, he leaned across the end of the table, his arms folded, and remained in that position for many minutes. I made no attempt to disturb him. Finally, he lifted his head slowly, got up, and walked to the door. Then turned around, come back, and laid his hand on my shoulder and said, My boy, you will need much courage if you remain steadfast in carrying out your purpose in life. But remember, when difficulties overtake you, the common people have common sense. Adversity will develop it. One evening, Edison arrived ahead of all the others. He walked over the seated himself at my left, where Emerson was accustomed to sit, and said, You are destined to witness the discovery of the secret of life. When the time comes, you will observe that life consists of great swans of energy or entities, each as intelligent as human beings thinks themselves to be. These units of life group together like hives of bees and remain together until they disintegrate through lack of harmony. These units have differences of opinion the same as human beings and often fight among themselves. These meetings which you are conducting will be very helpful to you. They will bring to your rescue some of the same units to life which served the members of your cabinet during their lives. These units are eternal. They never die, your own thought and desire serve as the magnet which attracts units of life from the great ocean of life out there. Only the friendly units are attracted, the ones which harmonizes with the nature of your desires. The other members of the cabinet began to enter the room, Edison got up and slowly walked around to his own seat, Edison was still living when this happened. It impressed me so greatly that I went to see him and told him about the experience. He smiled broadly and said, Your dreams was more a reality than you may imagine it to have been. He added no further explanation to his statement. These meetings became so realistic that I became fearful of their consequences and discontinued them for several months. The experiences were so uncanny, I was afraid if I continued them, I would lose sight of the fact that the meetings were purely experiences of my imagination. Some six months after I had discontinued the practice, I was awakened one night and, or thought I was when I was Lincoln standing at my bedside. He said, the world will soon need your services. It is about to undergo a period of chaos which will cause men and women to lose faith and become panic stricken. Go ahead with your work and complete your philosophy. That is your mission in a life. If you neglect it for any cause whatsoever, you will be reduced to, reduced to a primal state and be compelled to retrace the cycles through which you have passed during thousands of years. I was unable to tell the following morning whether I had dreamed this or had actually been awake and I have never since found out which it was. But I do know that the dream, if it were a dream, was so vivid in my mind the next day that I resumed my meetings the following night. At our next meeting, the members of my cabinet all all filed into the room together and stood at their accustomed places at the council table. While Lincoln raised a glass and said, Gentlemen, let us drink a toast to a friend who has returned to the fold. After that, I began to add new members to my cabinet. Until now, it consists of more than 50. Among them, Chris, St. Paul, Galileo, Copernicus, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Homer, Voltaire, Vinso, than Wilson and William James. This is the first time that I have had the courage to mention this. Here, herefore, I have remained quiet on the subject because I know from my own attitude in connection with such matters that I would be misunderstood if I described my unusual experience. I have been emboldened now to reduce my experience to the printed page because I am now less concerned about what they say than I was in the years that have passed. 
वन ऑफ द ब्लेसिंग ऑफ मैच्यूरिटी इज दैट इट समाइम्स ब्रिंग्स वन ग्रेटर करेज टू बी ट्रूथफुल रिगार्डलेस ऑफ वॉट दो डो नॉट अंडरस्टैंड मे थिंक और से let i be misunderstood i wish here to state most emphatically that i still regard my cabinet meetings as being purely imaginary but i feel entitled to suggest that while the members of my cabinet may be purely fictional and the meetings existent only in my own imagination they have led me into glorious paths of adventure rekindled an appreciation of true greatness encouraged creative endeavor and emboldened the expression of honest thought somewhere in the cell structure of the brain is located an organ which receives vibrations of thought ordinary called hunches so far since has not discovered where this organ of the sixth sense is located but this is not important the fact remains that human beings to dis- receive accurate knowledge through sources other than the physical senses such knowledge generally is received when the mind is under the influence of extraordinary stimulation any emergency which arouses the emotion and causes the heart to beat more rapidly than normal may and generally does bring the sixth sense into action anyone who has experienced a near accident while driving knows that on such occasions the sixth sense often comes to one's rescue and aids by split seconds in avoiding the accident these facts are mentioned preliminary to a statement to fa- statement of fact which i shall now make namely that during my meetings with the invisible counselors i find my mind most receptive to ideas thoughts and knowledge which reach me through the sixth sense i can truthfully say that i owe entirely to my invisible counselors full credit for such ideas facts or knowledge as i received through inspiration on scores of occasion when i have faced emergencies some of them so grave that my life was in a jail party jail party i have been miraculously guided past these difficulties through the influence of my oh, my invisible counselors my original purpose is conducting council meetings with imaginary beings was solely that of impressing my own subconscious mind through the principles of auto suggestion with certain characteristics which i desired to acquire i'm more in more recent years my experimentation has taken on an entirely different trend i now go to my imaginary counselor with every difficult problem which confronts me and my clients the results are often astonishing although i do not depend entirely on this form of counsel you of course have recognized that this cha- this chapter covers a subject with which a majority of people are not familiar the sixth sense is a subject that will be of a great interest and benefit to the person whose aim is to accumulate vast wealth but it need not claim the attention of those whose desires are more modest henry ford undoubtedly understand and makes practical use of the sixth sense his vast businesses and financial operations make it necessary for him to understand and use to understand and use this principle the late thomas a edison understood and used the sixth sense in connection with the development of inventions especially those involving basic patents in connection with which he had no human experience and no accumulated knowledge to guide him as was the case while he was working on the talking machine and moving picture machine nearly all great leaders such as napoleon bismarck john of arc chris buddha confucius and muhammad understood and probably made use of the sixth sense almost continuously the major portion of their greatness consisted of their knowledge of this principle the sixth sense is not something that one can take off and put on at will ability to use this great power comes slowly through the application of other principles outlined in this book seldom does any in, any individual come into workable knowledge of the sixth sense before the age of 
more often the knowledge is not available until one is well past 50 and this for the reason that the spiritual forces with which the sixth sense is slow co so closely related do not mature and become usable expect except through the years of meditation self examination and serious thoughts no matter who you are or what may have been your purpose in reading this book you can profit by it without understanding the principle described in this chapter this is especially true if your major purpose is that of accumulation of money or other material things the chapter on the sixth sense was included because the book is designed for the purpose of presenting a complete philosophy by which individuals may earningly guide themselves in attaining whatever they ask of life the starting point of all achievement is a desire. The finishing point is that brand of knowledge which leads to understanding, understanding of self, understanding of others, understanding of the laws of nature, recognition and understanding of happiness. This sort of understanding comes in its fullness only through familiarity with and use of principles of the sixth sense hence that principle had to be included as a part of this philosophy for the benefit of those who demand more than money having read having read the chapter you must have observed that while reading it you will you were lifted to a high level of mental stimulation splendid come back to this again a month from now a month from now Read it once more and observe that your mind will soar to a still higher level of stimulation. Repeat this experience from the time to time giving no concern as to how much or how little you learn at the time. And eventually you will find yourself in a possession of a power that will enable you to throw off a discouragement, master fear, overcome a procrastination and draw freely upon your imagination. Then you will have felt the touch of that unknown something which has been the moving spirit of every truly great thinking leader, artist, musician, writer and statesman then you will be in a position to transmute your desires into their physical or financial counterpart as easily as you may lie down and quiet at the first sign of the opposition faith versus fear previous chapters have described how to develop the faith through the auto suggestion desire and the subconscious mind the next chapter represents the detailed instruction for the mastery of fear here will be find here will be found a full description of the six fears which are the cause of all discouragement timidity procrastination indifference indecision and the lack of ambition self reliance initiative self control and enthusiasm search yourself carefully as you study these six enemies as they may exist only in your subconscious mind where their presence will be hard to detect Remember too, as you analyze the six ghosts of fear, that they are nothing but ghosts because they exist only in one's mind. Remember also that ghost creation of uncontrolled imagination have caused most of the damage people have done to their own minds. Therefore, ghosts can be as dangerous as if they lived and walked on the earth in physical bodies. The ghost of the fear of poverty with she seized the minds of millions of people in 1929 was so real that it caused the worst business depression this country has ever known. Moreover, this particular ghost still frightens some of us out of our wits. Let us get ahead with chapter number 15, how to outwit the six ghosts of fear. Take inventory of yourself as you read this closing chapter and find out how many of the ghosts are standing in your way. Before you can put your opinion of this philosophy into successful use, your mind must be prepared to receive it. The preparation is not difficult. It begins with study, analysis and understanding of three enemies which you shall have to clear out. These are the indecision, doubt and fear. The sixth sense will never function while these three negatives or any of them remain in your mind. 
the members of this unholy trio are closely related where one is found the other two are close at hand in the decision is a uh, is the sidling of fear remember this as you read in a decision crystallizes into doubt the two blend and became clear the blending process often is slow this is one reason why these three enemies are so dangerous they germinate and grow without their presence being observed the remainder of this chapter describes an end which must be attained before the philosophy as a whole can be put into practical use it also analyzes a condition which has but lately reduced huge number of people to poverty and it states a truth which must be understood by all who accumulate riches whether measured in terms of money or a state of mind of a far greater value than money the purpose of this chapter is to turn the spotlight of attention upon the cause and the cure of the six basic fears before we can master any enemy we must know its name its habits and its place of abode as you read analyze yourself carefully and determine which if any of the six common fears have attached themselves to you do not be deceived by the habit of these subtle enemies sometimes they remain hidden in the subconscious mind where they are difficult to locate and still more difficult to eliminate the six basic fears there are six basic fears with some combination of which every human suffers at one tune or another most people are fortunate if they do not suffer from the entire six named in the order of their most common appearance they are the fear of poverty the fear of criticism the fear of all ill health the fear of loss of love of someone the fear of old age and fear of death out of these the first three the fear of poverty criticism and ill health at the bottom of most one's worries these are lying or you can find these at the bottom of most of one's worries poverty criticism and ill health then next three fears the fear of loss of love of someone the fear of old age and the fear of death all other fears are of minor importance they can be grouped under these six headings the prevalence of these fears as a curse to the world runs in cycles for almost 6 years while the depression was on we flooded in the cycle of fear of poverty during the world war we were in the cycle of fear of cycle of fear of death just following the war we were in the cycle of fear of ill health as evidenced by the epidemic of a disease which spread itself all over the world fears are nothing more than states of mind once a state of mind is a subject to control and direction physician as everyone knows are less subject to attack by disease than ordinary layman for the reason that physicians do not fear disease physicians without fear or hesitation have been known to physically contact hundreds of people daily who were suffering from such contagious diseases as smallpox without becoming infected their immunity against the disease as a smallpox their immunity against the disease consisted largely if not solely in their absolute lack of fear man can create nothing which has which does not first conceive in the form of an impulse of thought following this statement come another of a still greater importance namely man's thought impulses begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent whether those thoughts are voluntary or involuntary thought impulses which are picked up picked up through the ether by mere chance thoughts which have been released by other minds may determine one's financial business profession professional or social destiny just as surely as do the thought impulses which one creates by intent and design we are here laying the foundation for the presentation of a fact of a great importance to the person who does not understand why some people appear to be lucky while others of equal or greater ability training experience and brain capacity seem destined to ride with misfortune 
This fact may be explained by the statement that every human being has the ability to completely control his own mind and with his control obviously every person may open his mind to the tram thought impulses which are being released by other brains or close the doors tightly and admit only the thought impulses of his own choice. Nature has endowed man with absolute control over but one thing and that is thought. This fact coupled with the additional fact that everything which man creates begins in the form of a thought leads one very near to the principle by which fear may be mastered. If it is true that all thoughts has a tendency to clothe itself in its physical equivalent and this is true beyond any reasonable room for doubt, it is equally true that thought impulses of fear and poverty cannot be translated into, into terms of courage and financial gain. The people of America began to think of poverty following the Wall Street crash of 1929 Slowly but surely that mass thought was crystallized into its physical equivalent which was known as a depression. This had to happen, it is in conformity with the laws of nature, the fear of poverty. There can be no compromise between poverty and riches. The two roads that lead to poverty and riches travel in opposite directions. If you want riches, you must refuse to accept any circumstance that leads towards poverty. The word riches is here used in its broadest sense, meaning financial, spiritual, mental and material estates. The starting point of the path that leads to the riches is a desire. In the chapter 1, you received full instruction for the proper use of the desire. In this chapter on fear, you have complete instruction for preparing your mind to, tame, to make a practical use of desire. Here then is the place to give yourself a challenge which will definitely determine how much of this philosophy you have absorbed. Here is the point at which you can turn prophet or foretell accurately what the future hold in store for you. If after reading this chapter you are willing to accept poverty, you may as well make up your mind to receive poverty. This is one decision you cannot avoid. If you demand riches, determine what form and how much will be required to satisfy you. You know the road that leads to riches. You have been given a road map which if followed will keep you on that road. If you neglect to make the start or stop before you arrive, no one will be to blame but you. This responsibility is reverse. This responsibility is yours. No alibi will save you from accepting the responsibility if you now fail or refuse to demand the riches of life because the acceptance call for but one thing, incidentally, the only thing you can control and that is a state of mind. A state of mind is a something that one assumes it cannot be purchased, it must be created. Fear of poverty is a state of mind, nothing else, but it is sufficient to destroy one's chances of achievement in any undertaking, a truth which became painfully evident during the depression. This fear paralyzes the faculty of reason, destroys the faculty of imagination, kills of self-reliance, undermines enthusiasm, discourages initiatives, leads to uncertainty of purpose, encourages procrastination, wipes out enthusiasm and makes self-control an impossibility. It takes the charm from one's personality, destroys the possibility of accurate thinking, diverts concentration of effort, it masters persistence, turns the willpower into nothingness, destroys ambition, beclouds the memory and invites failure in every conceivable form. It kills love and assimilates the finer emotion of the heart, discourages friendship and invites disaster in a hundred forms, leads to sleeplessness, misery and unhappiness. And all this despite the obvious truth that we live in a world of overabundance of everything the heart could desire with nothing standing between us and our desires, expecting lack of a definite purpose. 
the fear of poverty is without doubt the most destructive of the six basic fears it has been placed at the head of the list because it is the most difficult to master considerable courage is required to state the truth about the origin of this fear and still greater courage to accept the truth after it has been stated the fear of poverty grew out of a man's inherited tendency or tendency to prey upon his fellow man economically nearly all animals lower than man are motivated by instinct but their capacity to think is limited therefore they prey upon one another physically man with his superior sense of intuition with the capacity to think and to reason does not eat his fellow man bodily he gets more satisfaction out of eating him financially man is so avaricious that every conceivable law has been passed to safeguard him from his fellow man of all the ages of the world of which one we know anything the age in which we live seem we live seems to be one that is outstanding because of man's money mindedness a man is considered less than a dust of the earth unless he can display a fat bank account but if he has money never mind how he acquired it he is a king or a big shot he is about the law he rules in politics he dominates in business and the whole world about him bows in respect when he passes nothing brings man so much suffering and humility as poverty only those who have experienced poverty understands the full meaning of this it is no wonder that man fears poverty through a long line of inherited experience man has learned for sure that some men cannot be trusted where matters of money and earthly possessions are concerned this is a rather stinging indictment the worst part of it being that it is true The majority of marriages are motivated by the wealth possessed by one or both of the contracting parties. It is no wonder therefore that the divorce courts are busy. So eager is man to possess wealth that he will acquire it in whatever manner he can through legal methods if possible through other methods if necessary or expedient. Self analysis may disclose weakness which one does not like to acknowledge. This form of examination is essential to all who demand of life more than mediocrity and poverty. Remember as you check yourself point by point that you are both the court of the jury and prosecuting attorney and the attorney for the defense and that you are the plaintiff and the defendant also that you are on trial. Face the facts squarely ask yourself definite questions and demand a direct replies when the examination is over you will know more about yourself if you do not feel that you can be an impartial judge in this self examination call upon someone who knows you well to serve as a judge while you cross examine yourself you are after the truth get it no matter at what cost even though it may temporarily embarrass you The majority of people if asked what they fear most would reply I fear nothing. The reply would be inaccurate because few people realize that they are bound handicap wiped spiritually and physically through some form of fear. So subtle and deeply seated is the emotion of fear that one may go through life burdened with it never recognizing its presence. Only a courageous analysis will disclose the presence of this universal enemy. When you begin such an analysis search deeply into your character here is a list of the symptoms for which you should look in a difference symptoms of the fear of poverty first indifference commonly expressed through lack of ambition willingness to tolerate poverty acceptance of whatever compensation life may offer without protest mental and physical laziness lack of initiative imagination enthusiasm and self control and second one in decision the habit of permitting others to do one's thinking staying on the fence third doubt generally expressed through alibis and excuses designed to cover up explain away or apologize for one's failures sometimes expressed in the form of envy of those who are successful or by criticizing them next worry 
usually expressed by finding faults with others a tendency to spend beyond one's income neglect of personal appearance scowling and frowning enter intemperance in the use of alcoholic drinks sometimes thought the use of narcotics nervousness lack of poise self consciousness and lack of self reliance over question the habit of looking for the negative side of every circumstance thinking and talking of possible failures instead of concentrating upon the means of succeeding knowing all the roads to disaster but never searching for the plan to avoid failure waiting for the right time to begin putting the ideas and plans into action until the waiting becomes a permanent habit remembering those who have failed and forgetting those who have succeeded seeing the hole in the donut but overlooking the donut pessimism leading to indigestion poor elimination auto intoxication bad breath and bad disposition next procrastination the habit of putting up until tomorrow that which should have been done last year spending enough time in enough time in creating alibis and excuses to have done the job this symptom is closely related to over question doubt and worry refusal to accept responsibility when it can be avoided willingness to compromise rather than put up a stiff fight compromising with difficulties instead of harnessing and using them as a stepping stones to advancement bargaining with life for a penny instead of demanding prosperity appliance riches contentment and happiness planning what to do if and when overtaken by failure instead of burning all bridges and making retreat impossible weakness of and upon total lack of self confidence definiteness of purpose self control initiative enthusiasm ambition third thrift and sound reasoning ability expecting poverty instead of demanding riches association with those who accept poverty instead of seeking the company of those who demand and receive riches money talks some will ask why did you write a book about money why major riches in dollars alone some will believe and rightly so that there are other forms of riches more desirable than money yes there are riches which cannot be measured in terms of dollars but there are millions of people who will say give me all the money i need and i will find everything else i want the major reason why i wrote this book now and book book on how to get money is the fact that the world has but lately passed through an experience that left millions of men and women paralyzed with the fear of poverty what this sort of fear does to one was well described by westbrook pregler in the new york world telegram which is money is only clan shell or metal disc or scrap of paper and there are treasures of the heart and soul which money cannot buy but most people being broke are unable to keep this in mind and sustain their spirits when a man is down and out and on the street unable to get any job at all something happens to his spirit which cannot be observed in the droop of his shoulders the set of his hats his walk and his gaze he cannot escape a feeling of inferiority among people with a regular employment even though he knows they are definitely not his equal in character intelligence or ability these people even his friends feel on the other hand a sense of superiority and regard him perhaps unconsciously as a casualty he may borrow for a time but not enough to carry on in his accustomed way and he cannot continue to borrow very long but borrowing in itself when a man is borrowing merely to live is a depressing experience and money lacks the power of earn money to revive his spirit of course none of this applies to bumps or bumps or habitual never do wells but only to men of normal ambitions and self respect women conceal despair women in the same pred- predicament must be different we somehow do not think of women at all in considering the down and outers they are scarce in the bridly bridliness 
they rarely are seen begging on the streets and they are not recognizable in crowds by the same plain signs which identify busted men of course i do not mean the shuffling hands of the city street who are the opposite number of the confirmed male bums i mean reasonably young decent and intelligent women there must be many of them but their despair is not apparent maybe they kill themselves when a man is down and out he has a time on his hand for the brooding he may travel miles to see a man about a job and discover that the job is filled or filled or that it is one of those jobs with no best pay but only a commission on the sale of some useless knickknack which nobody would buy except out of pity turning that down he finds himself back on the street with the nowhere to go but just anywhere so he walks and walks he gazes into store windows at luxuries which are not for him and feels inferior and gives way to people who shop to look with an active interest he wanders into the railroad station or puts himself down into the library to ease his legs and soak up a little heat but that isn't looking for a job so he gets going again he may not know but his aimlessness would give him away even if the very lines of his figure did not he may be well dressed in the clothes left over from the days when he had a steady job but the clothes cannot disguise the droop money makes a difference he sees thousands of other people bookkeepers or clerks or chemists or wagon hands busy at their work and envies them from the bottom of his soul they have their independence their self respect and manhood and he simply cannot conceive him convince himself that he is a good man to though he argue it out and arrive at a favorable verdict hour after hour it is just money which makes this difference in him with a little money he would be himself again some employers take the most shocking advantage of people who are down and out the agencies hang out little color cards offering miserable wages to busted men 12 dollar a week 15 dollar a week and 18 dollar a week job is a plum and anyone with a 25 dollar a week to offer does not hang the job in front of an agency on a colored card i have a want ad clip from a local paper demanding a clerk a good clean penan to take the telephone orders for a swedish shop from 11 am to 2 pm for 8 dollars a month not 8 dollars a week but 8 dollars a month the ad says also state religion can you imagine the brutal effrontery of anyone who demands a good clean penum for 11 cent an hour enquiring into the victim's religion but that is what busted people are offered the fear of criticism just how man originally came by his fear no one can state definitely but one thing in certain he has it in a highly developed form some believes that this fear made it made its appearance about the time that politics become a profession other believe it can be traced to the age when women first began to concern themselves with the styles in wearing apparels this author being neither a humorist nor the prophet is inclined to attribute the basic fear of criticism to that part of the man's inherited nature which prompts him not only to take away his fellow man's good and wares but to justify his action by criticize criticism of his fellow man's character it is a well known fact that a thief will criticize the man from whom he steals that politicians seek office not by displaying their own virtues and qualifications but by attempting to besmirch their opponents the fear of criticism takes on many forms the majority of which are pretty and trivial bald headed men for example are bald for no other reason than their fear of criticism heads become bald become because of the tight tight fitting bands of hats which cut off the circulation from the roots of the hair men wear hats not because they actually need them but mainly because everyone is doing it 
the individual falls into the line and does likewise less lest some other individuals criticize him women seldom have bald heads or even thin hair because they wear hats which hit their heads loosely the only purpose of the hats being adornment but it must not be supposed that women are free from the fear of criticism if any woman claims to be the superior to man with a reference to his this fear ask to ask her to walk down the street wearing a hat of the vintage of 1890 the astute manufacturers of clothing have been seen slow to capitalize this basic fear of criticism with which all mankind has been cursed every season the styles in many articles of wearing apparels change who establishes the styles certainly not the purchaser of clothing but the manufacturer why does the change the styles so often the answer is obvious he changes the styles so he can sell more clothes for the same reason the manufacturers of automobile with a few rare and very sensible exceptions changes styles of the models every season no man wants to drive an automobile which is not of the latest style although the older model may actually be the better car we have been describing the describing the manner in which people behave under the influence of fear of criticism as applied to the small and petty things of life let us now examine human behavior when this fear affects people in a connection with the more important events of human relationship take for example practically any person who has reached the age of mental maturity from the 35 to 40 years of age as a general average and if you could read the secret thought of his mind you would find a very decided disbelief in most of the fables taught by the majority of the dogmatists and theologians a few decades back not often however will you find a person who has the courage to openly state his belief on this subject most people will if pressed far enough tell a lie rather than admit that they do not believe the stories associated with that form of religion which held people in bondage prior to the age of scientific discovery and education Why does the average person even in this day of enlightenment shy away from denying his belief in the fables which were the basis of most of the religions a few decades ago the answer is because of the fear of criticism men and women have been burned at the stake for daring to express disbelief in ghosts it is no wonder we have inherited a consciousness which makes us fear criticism The time was and not so far in the past when criticism carried severe punishment it still does in some countries the fear of criticism robs man of his initiatives destroys his power of imagination limits his individuality takes away his self reliance and does him damage in a hundred other ways parents often do their children's irreplaceable injury by criticizing them the mother of one of my boyhood chums used to punish him with a switch almost daily always completing the job with the statement you will land in the penitentiary before you are 20 he was sent to the reformatory at the age of 17 criticism is the one form of service of which everyone has too much everyone has a stock of it which is handed out gratis whether called for or not once nearest relatives often are the worst offenders it should be recognized as a crime in a reality it is a crime of the worst nature for any parent to build inferiority complex in the minds of a child through unnecessary criticism employers who understand human nature get the best there is in men not by criticism but by a constructive suggestion Parents may accomplish the same results with their children. Criticism will plant fear in the human heart or resentment but it will not build love or affection. Symptoms of the fear of a criticism. This fear is almost as universal as the fear of poverty and its effects are just as fatal to personal achievement mainly because this fear destroys initiative and discourages the use of imagination. The major symptoms of the fear are first 
सेल्फ कॉन्शियसनेस जनरली एक्सप्रेस थ्रू नर्वसनेस टिमिडिटी इन कॉन्वर्सेशन एंड इन मीटिंग स्ट्रेंजर्स ऑकवर्ड मूवमेंट ऑफ द हैंड्स एंड लिम्स शिफ्टिंग ऑफ द आईज सेकंड लैक ऑफ वॉइस Express through the lack of voice control, nervousness in the presence of others, poor posture of body, and poor memory. Next, personality, lacking in firmness of decision, personal charm, and ability to express opinions definitely. The habit of sidestepping issues instead of meeting them squarely. Agreeing with others without careful examination of their opinions. Inferiority complex. The habit of expressing self-approval by word of mouth and by action as a means of covering up a feeling of inferiority. Using big words to impress others upon without knowing the real meaning of the words. Imitating others in dress, speech and manners. Boasting of imaginary, imaginary achievements. This sometimes gives a surface appearance of a feeling of a superiority. Extravagance. The habit of trying to keep up with the Jonas spending beyond one's income, lack of initiative, failure to embrace opportunities for self-advancement, fear to express opinions, lack of confidence in one's own ideas, giving evasive answers to questions asked by superiors, hesitancy of manner and speech, dissent in both words and deeds, lack of ambition. Mental and physical laziness, lack of self-assertion, slowness in reaching decisions, easily influenced by the others and the habit of criticizing others behind their backs and flattering them to their faces, the habit of accepting defeat without protest, quitting an undertaking when opposed by others, suspicious of others' people without cause, lacking in a tactfulness of manner and speech. Unwillingness to accept the blame for mistakes. Let us get ahead with the next fear. The third fear of first group. The fear of ill health. So far we have completed the fear of poverty and fear of criticism. Let us get ahead with the fear of ill health. This fear may be traced to both the physical and social heredity. It is closely associated as to its origin with the cause of fear of old age and the fear of death because it leads one closely to the border of a terrible worlds of which man knows not but concerning which he has been taught some discomforting stories the opinions in a the opinion is somewhat general also that certain unethical people engaged in the business of selling health have had not a little to do with keeping alive the fear of ill health. In the men, in the men man fears ill health because of the terrible pictures which have been planted in his mind of what may happen if death should overtake him. He also fears it because of the economic toll which it may claim. A reputable physician estimated that 75% of the all people who visit physician for professional service are suffering from hypochondria. Hypochondria is nothing but imaginary illness. It has been shown most convincingly that the fear of disease, even where there is not the slightest cause of for fear, often produces the physical symptoms of disease fear. Powerful and mighty is the human mind, it builds or it destroys. Playing upon this common weakness of fear of ill health, dispensers of patent medicines have, medicines have reaped fortunes. This form of imposition upon a credulous humanity became so prevalent some 20 years ago that Clary Collier's weekly magazine conducted a bitter campaign against some of the worst offenders in the patent medicine business. During the flu academic which broke out during the world war, the mayor of the New York City took drastic steps to, steps to check the damage which people were doing themselves through their inherent fear of ill health. He called in the newspaper men and said to them, gentlemen, I feel it necessary to ask you not to publish any scare headlines concerning the flu epidemic. Unless you cooperate with me, we will have a situation which we cannot control. The newspapers quit publishing stories about the flu and within one month the epidemic had been successfully checked. 
थ्रू अ सीरीज ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंट्स कंडक्टेड सम इयर्स अगो इट वॉज प्रूव दैट पीपल मे बी मेड इल बाय सजेशन we conducted this experiment by causing three acquaintances to visit the victims each of whom asked the questions what else you you look terribly ill the first questioner usually provoked a grin and a nonchalant who oh, nothing i am all right from the victim the second questioner usually was answered with the statement i don't know exactly but i do feel badly The third questioner was usually met with a frank admission that the victim was actually feeling ill. Try this on an acquaintance if you doubt that it will make him uncomfortable but do not carry the experiment too far. There is a certain religious sect whose members make visions upon their enemies by the hexing method. They call it placing a spell on the victim. They call it placing a spell on the victim. There is a overwhelming evidence that disease sometimes begins in the form of negative thought impulses such as such an impulse may be passed from one mind to another by suggestion or created by an individual in his own mind a man who was blessed with more wisdom than this incident might indicate once said when anyone ask me how i feel i always want to answer by no by knocking him down Doctor spends patients in sends patients into new climates for their health because a change of mental attitude is necessary. The seed of fear of ill health lies in every human mind. Worry, fear, discouragement, disappointment, in love and business affairs cause this seed to germinate and grow. The recent business depression kept the doctors on the run because every form of negative thinking may cause ill health. Disappointments in business and in love stand at the head of the list. Disappointments in business and in love stand at the head of the list of causes of fear of ill health. A young man suffered a disappointment in love which sent him to a hospital. For months he hovered between life and death. A specialist in a suggestive therapist was called in. The specialist changed the nurse's placing nurses placing him in a charge of a very charming young woman who began by pre arrangement with the doctor to make love to him the first day of her arrival on the job within 3 weeks the patient was discharged from the hospital still suffering but with an entirely different melody he was in a love again the remedy was a hoax but the patient and the nurse were later married both are in good health at the time of this writing symptoms of the fear of ill health the symptoms of this almost universal fear are first autosuggestion the habit of negative use of self suggestion by looking for and expecting to find the symptoms of all kinds of disease enjoying imaginary illness and speaking of it as being real the habit of trying all fads and exams recommended by others as having therapeutic value talking to others of operations accidents and other forms of illness experimenting with diets physical exercises reducing systems without professional guidance trying home remedies patent medicines and quack remedies hypochondria the habit of talking illness concentrating the mind upon a disease and expecting its appearance until a nervous break occurs nothing that comes in bottles can cure this condition it is brought on mind by negative thinking and nothing but positive thought can affect a cure hypochondria a medical term for imaginary disease is said to do as much damage on occasion as the disease one fears might do most so called cases of nerves come from the imaginary illness exercise fear of ill health often interferes with proper physical exercise and results in overweight by causing one to avoid outdoor life susceptibility fear of ill health breaks down the nature's body resistance and creates a favorable condition for any form of disease one may contact the fear of ill health often is related to the fear of poverty especially in the case of hypochondriacy who constantly worries about the possibility of having to pay doctors bills hospitals bills etc etc this type of person spends much time preparing for sickness talking about death saving money for the cemetery lots and burial expenses etc 
सेल्फ कॉडलिंग द हैबिट ऑफ मेकिंग अ बिड फॉर सिंपति यूजिंग इमेजिनरी इलनेस एज द लर पीपल ऑपन रिजॉर्ट टू टू दिस ट्रिक टू अवॉइड वर्क द हैबिट ऑफ फिगनिंग इलनेस टू कवर प्लेन लेजीनेस और टू सर्व एज एन एलिबी फॉर द लैक ऑफ एम्बिशन एन टेम्परेंस द हैबिट ऑफ यूजिंग अल्कोहल और नार्कोटिक्स टू डिस्ट्रॉय पेन सच एज हेड एक और निरोलिया एटसेट्रा इंस्टेड ऑफ एलिमिनेटिंग द कॉज द हैबिट ऑफ रीडिंग अबाउट इलनेस एंड वरिंग ओवर द पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ बींग स्ट्राइकन बाई इट द हैबिट ऑफ रीडिंग पेशेंट पेटंट मेडिसिन एडवर्टाइजमेंट्स let us get ahead with the next fear the fear of loss of love the original source of this inherent fear needs but a little description because it obviously grew out of man's polygamous habit of stealing his fellow man's maid and his habit of taking liberties with her wherever he could jealousy and the other similar forms of dementia preox grow out of man's inherited fear of loss of love of someone This fear is the most painful of all the six basic fears that probably plays more havoc with the body and the mind than any of the other basic fears as it often leads to permanent insanity. The fear of loss of love probably dates back to the stone age when men stole women by brute force. They continue to steal females but their technique has changed instead of force they now use a persuasion and the promise of a pretty clothes motor cars and other bit much more effective than physical force man's habit are the same as they were at the dawn of civilization but he expresses them differently careful analysis careful analysis has shown that women are more susceptible to this fear than men this fact is easily explained women have learned from experience that men are polygamous by nature that they are not to be trusted in the hands of rivals symptoms of the fear of loss of love the distinguishing symptoms of this fear are first one jealousy the habit of being suspicious of friends and loved ones without any reasonable evidence of sufficient grounds jealousy is a form of a dementia preox which sometimes becomes violent without the slightest cause the habit of accusing wife or husband of in in fidelity without grounds general suspicion of everyone absolute faith in no one next one fault finding the habit of finding fault with friends relatives business associates and loved ones upon the slightest provocation or without any cause whatsoever last gambling the habit of gambling stealing cheating and otherwise taking hazardous chances to provide money for loved ones with the belief that love can be brought the habit of spending beyond one's means or incurring debts to provide gifts for loved ones when the object of making a favorable showing insomnia nervousness lack of persistence weakness of will lack of self control and lack of self reliance bad temper let us get ahead with the next fear the fear of old age in the men this fear grows out of two sources the first the thought that thought that old age may bring with it poverty secondly by far the most common sources of origin from the false and cruel teachings of the past which have been too well mixed with the fire and brimstone and other bogies cunningly designed to enslave man through fear in the basic fear of old age man has two very sound reasons for this apprehension one growing out of his distrust of his fellow man who may seize whatever worldly goods he may possess and the other arising from the terrible pictures of the world beyond which were planted in his mind through social heredity before he came into full possession of his mind the possibility of ill health which is more common as people grow older is also a contributing cause of this common fear of old age eroticism also enters into the cause of fear of old age as no man cherishes the thought of diminishing sex attraction the most common cause of fear of old age is associated with the possibility of a poverty poor house is not a pretty world 
इट थ्रोज अ चिल इन टू द माइंड ऑफ एवरी पर्सन हू फेसेस द पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ हैविंग टू स्पेंड हिज डिक्लाइनिंग इयर्स ऑन अ पुअर फॉर्म Another contributing cause of fear of old age is the possibility of loss of freedom and independence as old age may bring with it the loss of both physical and economic freedom. Symptoms of the fear of fear of old age. The common most symptoms of this fear are the tendency to slow down and develop an inferiority complex at the age of mental maturity around the age of 40. falsely believing oneself to be sleeping because of age the truth is that man's most useful years mentally and spiritually are those between 40 and 60 the habit of speaking apologetically of one's self as being old merely because one has reached the age of 40 or 50 instead of reversing the rule and expressing gratitude for having reached the age of wisdom and understanding the habit of killing up initiatives imagination and self reliance by falsely believing oneself too old to exercise these qualities the habit of the man or woman of 40 dressing with aim of trying to appear much younger and affecting mannerism of youth thereby aspiring ridicule by both friends and strangers and finally the sixth fear the fear of death to some this is the cruelest of all the basic fears the reason is obvious the terrible pages of fear associated with the thought of death in the majority of the cases may be charged directly to religious fantasism so called hithan are less afraid to death than the more civilized for hundreds of millions of years man has been asking the still unanswered questions whence and whether where did i come from and where am i going during the darker ages of the past the most cunning and crafty were not slow to offer the answer to these questions for a price witness now the major source of origin of the fear of death come into my tent embrace by embrace my faith accept my dogmas and i will give you a ticket that will admit you straight away into heaven when you die cries a leader of sarcanism remain out of my tent says the same leader and may the devil take you and burn you throughout eternity eternity is a long time fire is a terrible thing the thought of eternal punishment with fire not only causes man to fear death it often causes him to lose his reason it destroys interest in life and makes happiness impossible during my research i reviewed a book entitled a catalog of the gods in which were listed the 30000 gods which man has worship think of it 30000 of them represented by everything from a crawfish to a man it is a little wonder that man how become a frighten frighten at the approach of death while the religious leader may not be able to provide safe conduct into heaven nor by lack of such provision allows the unfortunate to descend into hell the possibility of the latter seems to be terrible that the very thought of it lays hold of the imagination in such a realistic way that it paralyzes it paralyzes reason and sets up the fear of death in a truth no man knows and no man has ever known what heaven or hell is like nor does any man know if either places actually exist this very lack of positive knowledge opens the door of the human mind to the charlatan so he may enter and control that mind with his stock of legendarmian and various brands of pious fraud and tickering the fear of death is not as common now as it was during the age when there were no great colleges and universities men of science have turned the spotlight of truth upon the world and this truth is rapidly freeing men and women from this terrifying terrible fear of death the young man and a young woman who attend the colleges and universities are not easily impressed by fire and the brimstone through the aid of biology astronomy geology and other related sciences the fear of the dark ages which gripped the minds of men and destroyed their reason have been dispelled insane asylums are filled with man and woman who have gone mad because of the fear of death 
This fear is useless. Death will come, no matter what anyone may think about it. Accept it as a necessity, and pass the thought out of your mind. It must be a necessity, or it would not come to all. Perhaps it is not as bad as it has been pictured. The entire world is made up of only two things: energy and matter. In elementary physics, we we'll learn that neither matter nor energy, the only two realities known to man, can be created nor destroyed. Both matter and energy can be transformed, but neither can be destroyed. Life is energy. If it is anything, if neither energy nor matter can be destroyed, of course, life cannot be destroyed. Life, like other forms of energy, may be passed through various processes of transition or change but it cannot be destroyed death is a mere transition if death is not a mere change or a transition then nothing comes after death except a long eternal peaceful sleep and sleep is nothing to be feared thus you may wipe out forever the fear of death the symptoms of the fear of death the general symptoms of this fear are the habit of thinking about dying instead of making the most of life due generally to lack of purpose or lack of suitable occupation this fear is more prevalent among the aged but sometimes the more youthful are victims of it the grateful of all remedies for the fear of death is a burning desire for achievement backed by useful service to others a busy person seldom has time to think about dying he finds life too thrilling to worry about death sometimes the fear of death is closely associated with the fear of poverty where one's death would leave loved ones poverty stricken in other cases the fear of death is caused by illness and the consequent breaking down of physical body in resistance the common set causes of the fear of death are ill health poverty lack of appropriate occupation disappointment over love insanity religious fantasism old man's worry worry is a state of a mind based upon fear it works slowly but persistently it is a insidious and subtle step by step it digs itself in until it paralyzes paralyzes one's reasoning faculty destroys self confidence and initiative worry is a form of a sustained fear caused by in a decision therefore it is a state of mind which can be controlled an unsettled mind is helpless in a decision makes an unsettled mind most individuals lack the will power to reach a decision promptly and to stand by them after they have been made even during normal business conditions during periods of economic unrest such as the world's recently experienced the individual is handicapped not alone by his inherent nature to be slow at the reaching decisions but he is influenced by the indecision of others around him who have created a state of mass in a decision during the depression the whole atmosphere all over the world was filled with the fears fearanza and worries the two mental diseases mental disease germs which began to spread themselves after the wall street frenzy in 1929 there is only one known antidote for these germs it is the habit of prompt and firm decision moreover it is an antidote which every individual must apply for himself we do not worry over conditions once we have reached a decision to follow a definite line of action i once interviewed a man who has the electrocuted two hours later the condemned man was the calmest of the some eight men who were in the death cell with him his calmness promoted me to ask him how it felt to know that he was going into eternity in a short while with a smile of confidence on his face he said it feels fine i just think brother my troubles will soon be over i have had nothing but trouble all my life it has been a hardship to get food and clothing soon i will not need these things i have lived fine ever since i learned for certain that i must die i made up my mind then to accept my fate in good spirit as he spoke he devoured a dinner of proportions of sufficient for three men eating every mouthful of the food brought to him and apparently enjoying it as much as if no disaster awaited him decision gave this man a resignation 
resignation to his fate decision can also prevent one's acceptance of undesired circumstances the six basic fears become translated into a state of worry through in a decision relieve yourself forever of the fear of death by reaching a decision to accept death as an in acceptable event in escapable escapable event with the fear of poverty by reaching a decision to get along with whatever wealth you can accumulate without worry put your foot upon the neck of the fear of criticism by reaching a decision not to worry about what other people think do or say eliminate the fear of old age by reaching a decision to accept it not as a handicap but as a great blessing which carries with it wisdom self control and understanding not known to you acquit yourself of the fear of ill health by the decision to forget symptoms master the fear of loss of love by reaching a decision to get along without love if that is a necessary kill the habit of worry in all its forms by reaching a general blanket decision that nothing which life has to offer is worth the price of worry with this decision will come poise peace of mind and calmness of thought which will bring happiness a man whose mind is filled with the fear not only destroys his own chances of intelligent action but he transmits these destructive vibrations to the minds of all who come in contact with him and destroys also their chances even a dog or a horse knows when its master lacks courage moreover a dog or a horse will pick up the vibrations of fear thrown up by its master and behave accordingly low down the line of intelligence in the animal kingdom one finds this same capacity to pick up the vibrations of fear a honey bee immediately senses fear in the mind of a person for reasons unknown a bee will sting the person whose mind is releasing vibrations of fear much more readily than it will molest the person whose mind registers no fear the vibrations of fear pass from one mind to another just as quickly as surely as the sound of a human voice passes from the broadcasting station to the receiving set of a radio and by the self same medium mental telepathy is a reality thoughts pass from one mind to another voluntarily whether or not this fact is recognized by either the person releasing the thoughts or the person who picks up those thoughts the person who gives expression by word of mouth to negative or destructive thoughts is practically certain to experience the results of those words in the form of a destructive kickback the release of destructive thought impulses alone without the aid of words produces also a kickback in more ways than one first of all and perhaps most important to be remembered the person who releases thoughts of a destructive nature must suffer damage through the breaking down of the faculty of creative imagination secondly the presence in the mind of any destructive emotion develops a negative personality which repels people and often converts them into antagonist the third source of the damage to the person who entertains or releases negative thoughts lies in this in a significant lies in this significant fact these thought impulses are not only damaging to others but they embed themselves in the subconscious mind of the person releasing them and there become a part of his character one is never through with a thought merely by releasing it when a thought is released it spreads it in every direction through the medium of the ether but it also plants itself permanently in the subconscious mind of the person releasing it Your business in life is a presumably to achieve success to be successful you must find peace of mind acquire the material needs of life and above all attain happiness all of these evidences of success begin in the form of thought impulses you may control your own mind you have the power to feed it whatever thought impulses you choose with this privilege with this privilege goes also the responsibility of using it constructively You are the master of your own earthly destiny just as surely as you have the power to control your own thoughts. 
यू मे इन्फ्लुएंस डायरेक्ट एंड इवेंचुअली कंट्रोल यूर ओन एनवायरमेंट मेकिंग यूर लाइफ वॉट यू वॉन्ट इट टू बी और यू मे निगलेक्ट टू एक्सरसाइज द प्रिवेज विच इज यूअर्स टू मेक यूर लाइफ टू ऑर्डर दस कास्टिंग यूर सेल्फ अपॉन द ब्रॉड सी ऑफ सरकमस्टांस वेर यू विल बी टॉस्ट हाइपर एंड जॉन लाइक अ चिप ऑन द वेव्स ऑफ अ ओशन Let us get ahead the Devil's Workshop, the seventh basic evil. Recently, we have completed the six ghosts or six fears that we need to conquer. Let us get ahead with the seventh basic evil. In addition to the six basic fears, there is another evil by which people suffer. It constitutes a rich soil in which the seeds of failure grow abundantly. it is so subtle that its presence often is not detected this affliction cannot properly be classed as a fear it is more deeply seated and more often fatal than all of the six fears for want for want of a better name let us call this evil susceptibility to negative influences evil susceptibility to negative influences men who accumulate great riches always protect themselves against this evil the poverty striker never do the poverty striker never do those who succeed in any calling must prepare their minds to resist the evil if you are reading this philosophy for the purpose of accumulating riches you should examine yourself very carefully to determine whether you are susceptible to negative influences If you neglect this self analysis you will forfeit your right to attain the object of your desires make the analysis searching after you read the question prepared for this self analysis hold yourself to a strict accounting in your answers go at the task as carefully as you would search for any other enemy you knew to be awaiting you in ambush and deal with your own faults as you would with a more tangible enemy you can easily protect yourself against highway robbers because the law provides organized cooperation for your benefit but the seventh basic evil is more difficult to master because it strikes when you are not aware of its presence when you are asleep and while you are awake moreover it's its weapon is intangible because it consists of merely a state of mind this evil is also dangerous because it strikes in as many different forms as there are human experiences sometimes it enters the mind through the well meant words of one's own relatives at other times it bores from within through one's own mental attitude always it is a deadly as a it is as deadly as poison even though it may not kill as quickly how to protect yourself against the negative influences to protect yourself against negative influences whether of your own making or the result of the activities of negative people around you recognize that you will you have a will power and put it into constant use until it builds a wall of immunity against negative influences in your own mind recognize the fact that you and every other human being are by nature lazy in a different and susceptible to all suggestions which harmonize with your weaknesses recognize that you are by nature susceptible to all the six basic fears and set up and set up habits for the purpose of counteracting all these fears recognize that negative influences often work on you through your subconscious mind therefore they are difficult to detect and keep your mind closed against all people who depress or discourage you in any way clean out your medicines clean out your medicine chest throw away all pill bottles and stop pandering to colds aches pains and imaginary illness deliberately see, deliberately seek the company of people who influence you to think and act for yourself do not expect troubles as they have a tendency not to disappoint without doubt the most common weakness of all human beings is the habit of leaving their minds open to the negative influences of other people this weakness is this weakness is all the more damaging because most people do not recognize that they are cursed by it and many who acknowledge it neglect or refuse to correct the 
evil until it comes an uncontrollable part of their daily habits. To aid those who wish to see themselves as they really are, the following list of questions has been prepared. Read the questions and state your answers aloud so you can hear your own voice. This will make it easier for you to be truthful with yourself. Self-analysis test questions. Do you complain often of feeling bad and if so, what is the cause? Do you find fault with other people at the slightest provocation? Do you frequently make mistakes in your work and if so, why? Are you sarcastic and offensive in your conversation? Do you deliberately avoid the association of anyone and if so, why? Do you suffer frequently with inner digestion? If so, what is the cause? Does life seem fertile and future hopeless to you? If so, why? Do you like your occupation? If not, why? Do you often feel self-pity? And if so, why? Are you envious of those who excel you? To which do you devote most time thinking of success or of failures? Are you gaining or losing self-confidence as you grow older? Do you learn something of value from all mistakes? Are you permitting some relative or acquaintance to worry you? If so, why? Are you sometimes in the clouds and the other times in the depths of despondency? Who has the most inspiring influence upon you? What is the cause? Do you tolerate negative or discouraging influences which you can avoid? Are you careless of your personal appearance? If so, when and why? Have you learned how to drone your trouble, how to drone your troubles by being too busy to be annoyed by them? Would you call yourself a sp spineless weakling if, if you permitted others to do your thinking for you? Do you neglect internal bathing until auto intoxication makes you ill-tempered and irritable? How many preventable disturbances annoy you and why do you tolerate them? Do you resort to liquor, narcotics or cigarettes to quit your nerves? If so, why do you not try willpower instead? Does anyone nag you and if so, for what reason? Do you have a definite major purpose and if so, what is it and what plan have you for achieving it? Do you suffer from any of the six basic fears? If so, which ones? Have you a method by which you can shield yourself against the negative influences of others? Do you make a deliberate use of association to make your mind positive? Which do you value most, your material possession or your privilege of controlling your own thoughts? Are you easily influenced by others against your own judgment? Has today added anything of value to your stock of the knowledge or state of mind? Do you face squarely the circumstances which make you unhappy or sidestep the responsibility? Do you analyze all mistakes and failures and try to profit by them or do you take the attitude that this is not your duty? Can you name three of your most three of your most damaging weaknesses? What are you doing to correct them? Do you encourage other people to bring their worries to you for sympathy? Do you choose from your daily experiences, lessons or influences which aid in your personal advancement? Does your presence have a negative influence on other people as a rule? What habit of other people annoy you most? Do you form your own opinions or permit yourself to be influenced by other people? Have you learned how to create a mental state of mind with which you can shield yourself against all discouraging influences? Does your occupation inspire you with faith and hope? Are you conscious, conscious of possessing spiritual forces of sufficient power to enable you to keep your mind free from all forms of fear? Does your religion help you to keep your own mind positive? Do you feel it your duty to share other people's worries? If so, why? 
if you believe that birds of a feather flock together what how you learn about yourself by studying the friends whom you attract what connection if any do you see between the people with whom you associate most closely and any unhappiness you may experience could it be possible that some person whom you consider to be a friend is in a reality your worst enemy because of his negative influence on your mind by what rules do you judge who is helpful and who is damaging to you are you intimate as are your intimate associates mentally superior or inferior to you how much time out of every 24 hours do you devote to your occupation sleep play and relaxation acquiring useful knowledge play and waste who among your acquaintances encourage your most questions you most discourages you most helps you most in other ways what is your greatest worry why do you tolerate it when others offer you free unsolicited advice do you accept it without question or analyze their motive what about all else do you most desire do you intend to acquire it are you willing to subordinate all other desires for this one how much time daily do you devote devote to acquiring it do you change your mind often if so why do you usually finish everything you begin are you easily impressed by other people's business or professional titles colleges colleges college degrees or wealth are you easily influenced by what other people think or say of you do you cater to people because because of their social or financial status whom do you believe to be the greatest person living in what respect is this person superior to yourself how much time have you devoted to studying and answering these questions at least one day is necessary for the analysis and answering of the entire list if you have answered all these questions truthfully you know more about yourself than the majority of people study the questions carefully come back to them once each week for several months and be astounded at the amount of additional knowledge of great value to yourself you will have gained by the simple method of answering the questions truthfully if you are not certain concerning the answers to some of the questions seek the counsel of those who know you well especially those who have no motive in flattering you and see yourself through their eyes the experience will be astonishing you have absolute control over but one thing and that is your thoughts this is the most significant and inspiring of all facts known to man it reflects man's divine nature this divine prerogative is the sole means by which you may control your own destiny if you fail to control your own mind you may be sure you will control nothing else if you must be careless with your possessions let it be in connection with material things your mind is your spiritual estate protect and use it with the care to which divine royalty is entitled you were given a will power for this purpose unfortunately there is no legal protection against those who either by design or ignorance poison the minds of others by negative suggestion this form of destruction should be punishable by heavy legal penalties because it may and often does destroys one's chances of acquiring material things which are protected by law men with negative minds tried to con convince thomas a. edison that he could not build a machine that would record the record and reproduce the human voice because they said no one else had ever produced such a machine edison did not believe them he knew that the mind could produce anything the mind could conceive and believe and that knowledge was the thing that lifted the great edison above the common herd men with a negative mind told fw woolworth he would go broke trying to run a store on five and ten cent cells he did not believe them he knew that he could do anything with within reason 
if he backed his plans with faith exercising his right to keep other men's negative suggestions out of his mind he piled up a fortune of more than 100 million dollars men with a negative minds told george washington he could not hope he could not hope to win against the vastly superior forces of the british but the exercise his divine right to believe therefore this book was published under the protection of the stars and stripes which while the name of lord cornwells has been all but forgotten doubting thomas scoffed scornly when henry ford tried out of his first cruelly built automobile on the street of detroit some said the thing never would become practical others said no one would pay money for such a contraption ford said i will i will build the earth with the def, with the dependable motor cars and he did what ford said i will build the earth with dependable motor cars and he did his decision to trust his own judgment has already piled up a fortune far greater than the next few generations of his descendants can squander for the benefit of those seeking vast riches let it be rem remembered that practically the sole difference between henry ford and a majority of more than 100000 men who work for him in this ford has a mind and controls it the others have minds which they do not try to control Henry Ford has been repeatedly mentioned because he is, he is an astonishing example of what a man with a mind of his own and a will to control it can accomplish. His record knocks the foundation from the under that time worn alibi, I never had a chance. Ford never had a chance either but he created an opportunity and backed it with persistence until it made him richer than the crows mind control is the result of self discipline and habit you either control your mind or it controls you there is no hallway compromise the most practical of all methods for controlling the minds is the habit of keeping it busy with a definite purpose backed by a definite plan study the record of any man who achieves noteworthy success and you will observe that he has a control over his own mind moreover that he exercises that control and directs it towards the attainment of definite objectives without this control success is not possible 57 famous alibis by old man a People who do not succeed have one distinguishing trait in common they know all the reasons for failure and how what and how what they believe to be airtight alibis to explain away their own lack of achievement some of these alibis are clever and a few of them are justifiable by the facts but alibis cannot be used for money the world wants to know only one thing how you achieved success a character analyst compiled a list of the most commonly used alibis as you read the list examine yourself carefully and determine how many of these alibis if any are your own property remember too the philosophy presented in this books makes every one of these alibis obsolete if i didn't have a wife and a family if i had enough pull if i had money if i had a good education if i could get a job if i had good wealth if i only had time if times were better if other people understood me if conditions around me were only different if i could live my life over again if i did not fear what they would say if i had been given a chance if i now had a chance if other people didn't have it in for me if nothing happens to stop me if i were only younger if i could only do what i want if i had been born rich if i could meet the right people if i had the talent that some people have if i dared assert myself if i only had embraced past opportunities 
if people didn't get on my nerves if i didn't how to keep house and look after the children if i could save some money if the boss only appreciated me if i only had somebody to help me if my family understood me if i lived in a big city if i could just get started if i were only free if i had the personality of some people if i were not so fat if my talents were known if i could just get a break if i could only get out of debt if i hadn't failed if i only knew how if everybody didn't oppose me if i didn't have so many worries if i could marry the right person if people weren't so dumb if my family were not so extravagant if i were sure of myself if i if luck were not against me if i had not been born under the wrong star if it were not true that what is to be will be if i did not how to work to so hard if i hadn't lost my money if i lived in a different neighborhood if i didn't have a past if i only had a business of my own if other people would only listen to me if and this is the greatest of them all i had the courage to see myself as a really am i would find out what is wrong with me and correct it then i might have i might have a chance to profit by my mistakes and learn something from the experience of others for i knew that there is a something wrong with me and i would now be where i would have been if i had spent more time analyzing my weaknesses and less time building alibis to cover them building alibis with which to explain away failure is a national pastime the habit is a, a habit is as old as human race and is fatal to success why do people cling to their pet alibis The answer is obvious they defend their alibis because they create them a man's alibis is the child of his own imagination it is a human nature to defend one's own brain child building alibis is a deeply rooted habit and habits are difficult to break especially when they provide justification for something we do plato had this truth in the mind when he said the first and the best victory is to conquer self to be conquered by self is of all things the most shameful and vile another philosopher had same thought in mind when he said it was a great surprise to me when i discovered that most of the ugliness i saw in the others was but a reflection of my own nature it has always been a mystery to me said albert hubbard why people spend so much time deliberately fooling themselves by creating alibis to cover their weaknesses if used differently this same time would be sufficient to cure the weakness and then no alibis would be needed in a parting i would remind you that life is a a life is a checkerboard and the player opposite to you is a time if you hesitate before moving or neglect to move promptly your men will be wiped off the board by time you are playing against a partner who will not tolerate in a decision previously you may have had a logical excuse for not having forced life to come through with whatever you asked but that alibi is now absolute because you are in the possession of the master key that unlocks the door to life's bountiful reaches The master key is intangible but it is powerful it is a, the privilege of creating in your own mind a burning desire for a definite form of riches there is a no penalty for the use of key but there is a price you must pay if do not use it the price is a failure there is a reward of stupendous proportions if you put the key to use it is a, the satisfaction that comes to all who conquer self and force life to pray whatever is asked the reward is worthy of your effort will you make the start and be conceived, convinced if we are related said the immortal emerson we shall meet in a closing may i borrow his thought and say 
if we are related we have through these pages met that said this is nothing but all about part number 5 of this think and grow rich which is written by napoleon hill this audio book is concerned so far we have completed all of you parts of this very special book if you have missed any of the part you can find the link of that part in the description box and you can enjoy the learnings and as we have decided earlier or at the start of this a uh, part number for you we have discussed what are the advantages or benefits we are going to have as a result of reading or listening these self help category books so please make sure that this video should reach over a million people so that this book has already helped millions of people let us add a few more millions into that category and let us help them to realize their true potential and by realizing their true potential let them or uh, let them achieve the greatest of their lives as they can pretty much sure that you are going to help me to support a, over a million people by sharing these audio books with as many people as you can and in order to encourage our team's efforts or in order to appreciate our efforts please do subscribe to our channel and press the bell notification so that our upcoming audio books notifications will be received by at received at your end and those audio books will be at your service okay so please do share these videos with as many people as you can so that you are we are on a mission and you are going to help in that mission what is our mission we are trying to reach as many people as we can and we are trying to create this world more peaceful joyful and loving in order to make this world more peaceful joyful and loving what we need to do we need to enhance their personal self and in order to enhance their personal self these self help categories will self help category audio books will play a much important role तो आशा करता हूँ कि आप ये जो मिशन है इसके दौरान आप हम सबको मदद करेंगे चलिए तो मिलते हैं इन द नेक्स्ट एपिसोड विद अ न्यू ऑडियो बुक अगर आप चाहते हैं कि कोई स्पेसिफिक ऑडियो बुक जो है वो हम तैयार करें या कोई एक बुक है डॉक्यूमेंट है या कोई आर्टिकल है जिसकी वजह से आपके और आपके आजू के लोगों की लाइफ अगर चेंज हुई है तो प्लीज डू सेंड दो आर्टिकल्स और दो बुक्स और डॉक्यूमेंट टूवर्ड्स अस सो दैट वी कैन segregate out it and we can read uh, read those documents for you along with all of our viewers aur aapki ek ek choti si cheez kya kar sakti hai kisi insaan ki life bhi badal sakti hai okay to chaliye milte hain with the next episode tab tak haste rahiye muskurate rahiye kuch acha sunte rahiye agar aapko bahar jane ki zarurat pad rahi hai to please wear mask and maintain social distancing and intermittently wash your hands with other soap or sanitizer Thank you thank you so much all of you for connecting with us and supporting our mission to reach millions of people and create this world more peaceful joyful and loving thank you thank you so much all of you once again for connecting with us have a great day ahead appreciate our efforts by subscribing to our channel thank you